In this video, we're looking at the second half of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. The sermon I preached from this section I called Fight the Good Fight. If you haven't yet watched the previous video, that would really help you to set up some of the context for the whole book of Timothy. And in that previous section, we really saw Paul uh, defending or asking Timothy, charging Timothy to defend the gospel, this uh, glorious news that Jesus saves and transforms people. And in this section, he's fleshing that out. He's giving the how and the why of that. And in this section, we get to uh, one of the, the key verses that sets up Paul's thesis for this letter. And that thesis is that God is a God who saves. We see it in verse 1 of chapter 1. Uh, we'll see it in the middle of this passage. And we're going to see it in the next week's passage in chapter 2 as well, that God wants all people to be saved. And that is the truth that Paul wanted Timothy to keep central in everything that happened in this church in Ephesus. He didn't want them to lose the centrality of the gospel of salvation through Jesus. So in this passage, verse 15 is a key passage, a key verse. Uh, that shows the centrality of the salvation that Paul is, wants Timothy to fight to keep in the church. If you haven't yet done so, I really do encourage you to take some time, stop the video, read through the passage a few times for yourself, and just look out for some key repetition, maybe look out for sections that you're not sure what's going on, ask some questions of those sections, and then spend some time praying. Ask God to help you to understand His Word not just as an academic exercise, but so that you will know him better, love him more, and as you dig into this passage, that that would fuel your love for him, because this truly is an incredible, incredible chapter. Throughout this letter, the spotlight is on our Lord Jesus, um, who he is, and what he came to do, and that's no different in this section. But one of the specific things that Paul is doing in this section is he's putting the spotlight on himself and he's showing the difference that the Lord Jesus has made in his own life. And as we'll see a little bit later, he's doing this to hold up his own life as an example. Uh, he, wants, he wanted the world to look in and see, wow, well, if Paul could be saved, then there truly is hope for anyone. And so he, he holds himself up, and we'll see here that he, he says that he is an example for those who would believe. So his salvation story through our Lord Jesus is an example so that others might hear of his salvation story and turn to King Jesus. So in this first part of this section, Paul is focusing in on himself, and then in the second part, he comes back to Timothy, so linking back to what we saw at the beginning of chapter 1, um, he, he says, remember the command or the charge. Now, this command, if you're not sure of what that is, go back, look at the previous uh, section or go and watch the previous video. Paul had commanded Timothy to tell the false teachers to stop teaching. Because a false gospel cannot save. And Paul's thesis in this whole section is that he wants to keep the gospel central because it's only the gospel that can save people. And that's why this verse is such an important verse for us to uh, remember. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says here that it is a trustworthy saying now, if you go and look through the rest of this letter and then into 2 Timothy and the book of Titus, you'll see five of these trustworthy sayings. And it's kind of like Paul using his words like a spotlight to say, this is vitally important for you to grab hold of. And so here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, this truth actually astounded Paul. He, he's saying... God considered me trustworthy. He appointed me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. 
Now you can go and read about who Paul was in Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. You can hear his own testimony about himself in Acts chapter 26 uh, or in Acts chapter 22 as well. Paul was working as hard as he could to try and destroy any memory of our Lord Jesus, of who he was and what he came to do. Paul didn't believe it. But then he says, but there should be a but here. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now, Paul is contrasting himself here to the false teachers. Um, They had professed faith in our Lord Jesus, and yet they were living evil lives. He's saying the way he lived, his evil life, was evidence that he was living in unbelief. He hadn't yet placed his faith in our Lord Jesus. Now, faith is a very important theme throughout this letter. If you go and read the whole letter and just look out for that, the word belief or unbelief or faith or placing your trust, uh, it is a very big idea throughout this letter. And Paul wants to make sure that that faith is placed in the right place. And in this first section, he's showing why that faith is worth being placed in our Lord Jesus. Because he says, Even though he was a blasphemer, persecutor, a violent man, he was the type of person who nobody would have expected to become a Christian. He was shown mercy. God opened his eyes to see that he had acted in ignorance and unbelief. And then this verse 14 is an absolutely glorious verse. He says, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. And this word in the Greek has a a hooper, in front of it, showing that it is a super abundance. So it's not just abundantly, it's super abundantly. God's grace in super abundance, but not only God's grace, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So this is important to see. It's not just God's grace that is a gift from him that he pours out super abundantly, but faith, because it says along with, faith. Faith is also something that's poured out super abundantly. Love is something that is poured out super abundantly. And Paul wanted Timothy to be absolutely sure of the transforming power of grace. It took somebody who was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, and it turned him into a servant of the King of Kings, the King Eternal. And after highlighting just how amazing that grace poured on him abundantly is. He then says this, here is a trustworthy saying. So he's saying, pay very careful attention. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst or the foremost. But then he gives a reason why Jesus saved him. He says, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So there's that word mercy again. So he was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners or the foremost of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience or his perfect patience as an example. So Paul is saying, my life, my salvation story is an example to all who would believe. Because the world of Paul's day would have looked in at him. When, if, you, if you go and read Acts 8 and 9, uh, you'll see the world of his day were looking in and saying, how could this man be the one who God decided to use to take this good news to the Gentiles? But actually Paul's life was an example. So that people could say, well, if Jesus came to save him, the worst of sinners, the one who was trying to destroy any memory of Jesus, if Jesus could save him, that's a great example that we can say, well, then Jesus came to save sinners like Paul, sinners like me, sinners like that person who comes to mind who you think is beyond salvation. Jesus came to save anyone who would believe in him. And that's very important. It's not just believe. Our world says, as long as you've got faith, it doesn't matter what your faith is in. 
But Jesus is saying, or Paul is saying, no, 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 it's for those who believe in him. And this all lines up with what Jesus said himself. If you go and uh, read Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So again, he came to seek and save sinners. And then John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will receive everlasting life. You see, salvation, eternal life, is on offer to all who will believe in Jesus, trusting that he came to save sinners like them. And that's what Paul is doing in this section. He wants us to stand amazed that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he erupts. He starts at this section with thanksgiving. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. But then he erupts into praise, from thanks to praise, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible. And yet, the invisible God came. John says, the word became flesh. So John 1 verse 14, we have seen his glory. And they got to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. The invisible God made himself known in the person of Jesus. So now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. God has no rivals. He is the only God. As he says in Isaiah, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Paul is saying we have a great God, a God who saves, a God who pours superabundant grace, who shows mercy, who gives us faith and love. And now to this God, the King eternal, the one who gives eternal life, who we will be with for eternity, the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul is just erupting in thanks and praise. But now, after putting the spotlight on just how amazing the gospel is, he comes back to what he had said in the previous section, in the first few verses of chapter 1, where he had given this command, where he said, stop the false teachers. And he says in verse 5 of chapter 1, the goal of this command is love. Now what we saw in chapter in that first section is that the false teachers weren't, their teaching wasn't resulting in people loving each other. It was resulting in a controversial speculation and people trying to follow the law in order to uh, get right with God. And Paul is saying, no, 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 you've got it the wrong way around. Actually, those false teachers need to be stopped. And so after highlighting the gospel again for Timothy, he says, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight. Or fight the battle well. Now as Timothy heard that, as this Ephesian church heard that, they should have thought back to Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul spoke about the spiritual battle that we're in. And he told them to put on the full armor of God so that they could fight. And that was what Paul is saying here. He's saying you need to remember that you're in a battle. It is a spiritual battle. And what he wants us to see in this section is the way to fight in this battle is that we need the gospel in order to fight for the gospel. Use the gospel to fight for the gospel. So the way that we fight the good fight or fight the battle well is that we use the gospel to fight for the gospel. And that's why he says here, holding on to faith. We need to hold on to this message of grace, this truth that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We need to hold on to our trust in what God has done for us in Jesus. And Paul stresses this, he gives this command, thinking of the false teachers, because he says some have rejected doing this, and they've suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. 
They aren't following Jesus. And when he says they've suffered shipwreck with regards to their faith, he's actually saying um, their faith was never genuine. It wasn't the chapter 1 verse 5 kind of faith, the sincere, genuine faith. And we know that because they shipwrecked it. True, genuine faith keeps going. True, genuine faith holds on to that faith. True, genuine faith uses the gospel to fight to keep the gospel in our hearts. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to fight to keep the gospel in our hearts so that we'll keep the gospel in our church. And he says that Hymenaeus and Alexander haven't done that. They've shipwrecked their faith. So he handed them over to Satan. And simply what that means is that he, he treated them as unbelievers. So he didn't see them as a part of the church anymore. Uh, he, he knew that they dwelt outside of the community of God's people in the world, which is Satan's realm. And Paul's goal in doing that, he would have been praying that they would have come to their senses and seen that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like them. He would have wanted them to come back, but he had to treat them like this. Because as he says, if you go and read in 2 Timothy, he says that his teaching will spread like gangrene. And if gangrene isn't dealt with, it will be deadly. And so Paul is saying, you've got to take these guys very seriously, get them out of the church, that they don't have influence, that they won't cause others to shipwreck their faith. Rather, encourage and challenge your church to be those who hold on to the faith who use the gospel to fight for the gospel, who hold on to the truth of this grace that is poured out on us super abundantly, who hold on to this truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now this is a glorious, glorious passage to be reflecting on, and it should be one that we want to think about and pray through as uh, churches, as small groups, as individuals within the church. We should be praying that God would help us to hold on to the faith and a good conscience. And Paul's going to flesh that out as the letter goes on. And he wants us to fight, the fight of faith, to keep the gospel in the church. And we do that by keeping the gospel in our own hearts, rejoicing in who Jesus is and what he came to do for us. Well, as you dig in further, I pray that the truth of this passage will thrill your own heart and that as you teach it to others, that they too would rejoice in this glorious truth that Christ Jesus came into this, the world to save sinners. If he came to save Paul as the example, there's hope for anyone. If he could save you, if he could save me, then there is hope for anyone. So we need to fight to hold on to this truth because we also know that by believing in him, we receive eternal life. The best by far is yet to come. So fight the battle well and hold on to this faith. Well, God bless as you dig in further.